You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is episode 69, covering the week of April 24th to April 28, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Before we get started with our information this week and our material that we're going to cover, I'd like to remind everyone to uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, like our YouTube page. If you do like this podcast, please share it around on social media. Also, if you like what we do, if you like our over 1,000 articles that we have on the website, hundreds of free audio lectures, our conferences, and other material that we do for educational purposes alone, you can give a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. Just go to abbevilleinstitute.org and go up to, at the top of the menu, you'll see uh, support. Go down for memberships for individuals, and you can find lots of different ways to give. I've said this before, both in our email, or, which I'll talk about in a second, and, of course, on this podcast. If everyone listening would just give us 5 bucks a month, it would go a long way to help supporting everything that we do at the Institute and also expanding our program. So you can do that. You can donate monthly. You can donate annually. So please consider giving a tax-deductible contribution to the Institute. Also, get on our email list. Just go on up to the uh, top of the page there. You can see that you can get a free ebook, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell, for simply giving us an email address. We'll send you a – you will get a daily email out of that called the Daily Dose of Dixie. And also, you will get a weekly email – that has all the information for the week, plus an extra article, including a link to this podcast. So uh, go on over and give those things, and we do try to contact you in different ways besides just putting out our information. But uh, please consider uh, helping us out and helping us explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We do rely on your generous contributions for our continued existence. Okay, so that said, let's talk about all the material that we had for this week. Uh, this week was, uh, was an interesting week, uh, primarily because of two reasons. One, uh, we had, uh, of course, a situation beginning in Louisiana that uh, has been brewing for a long time, but finally the city of Louisiana decided to pull down one of the Confederate uh, monuments in Louisiana, in New Orleans, I should say. It's, it's actually New Orleans, not just Louisiana, but the city government of New Orleans decided to pull down one of those monuments. And so we'll see what happens to the other ones. But um, we had a great piece this week by Boyd Cathy on that particular issue. Uh, but we we also had a piece on literature this week and um, uh, a, a book review. That is one thing you're going to start seeing more often. Our uh, Abbeville Review section is probably going to become a book review section alone. So uh, we're going to run book reviews through there. And, of course, these books are going to be books that um, uh, maybe we think you should read, maybe we think you shouldn't read, but uh, you need to know about. So uh, there's going to be a lot of great things coming through there, some older book reviews and also some some new reviews of newer books that are out. But that's where that material is going to be placed. Uh, and uh, then we, we had some articles about um, uh, a uh, faux news, uh, and I'll talk about that. But uh, and last but not least, an article about uh, a great anti-federalist from Virginia. Now, the common theme here is the rewriting of history by Northerners or the rewriting of Southern culture and society and what it means and what it was by Northerners. Um, and I, maybe it was hard to see that as you looked at the material, but that's the overarching theme. And of course, we've talked about this before uh, on this particular podcast, but uh, generally that's what you see out of uh, American history or American literature. It's the uh, America, quote-unquote, is the North. And that didn't happen until the uh, middle of the 19th century into the late 19th century that people started considering America to be the North. For years, uh, most people considered America to be the South. It was the first colony, after all. Uh, Jamestown, Virginia, was the first permanent English settlement in North America. The first permanent European settlement was in the South, too, in St. Augustine, Florida. Most of the uh, people that Europeans considered to be Americans, or at least representative of America, came from the South. Uh, the one major exception, of course, being Benjamin Franklin. But you look at Washington and Jefferson and Madison. Uh, they came from the South. Of course, Hamilton from the North. But um, I think the South dominated what people considered to be America outside of what became the United States. And that's because the South is very much like the rest of the world. 
in the 18th and 19th century. It was the North that was a little bit odd. Now, as you move forward in Western civilization, and, and of course the North industrializes faster than the South, you'll find that, of course, Britain was industrializing, Germany was industrializing, France was industrializing. So in that particular way, the North became uh, a section similar to those regions, those countries, nation-states, and then regions. Germany wasn't yet a unified nation-state until the middle of the 19th century. So in that way, their economy was the same. Uh, and so the South lagged behind. But still, Southern culture was, was representative of uh, this kind of older order in uh, in Europe that was generally under attack, but still, um, I think, something that uh, people still recognized as a traditional Western civilization culture. So holding on to that, understanding what that is, that's one of the keys to understanding what the South is. And when I say things like the South is America... Uh, understanding that particular idea uh, is is very important to getting to the heart of Southern society and Southern culture. So the first particular piece of the week was about Flannery O'Connor. It was written by Michael Jordan, who's a professor of literature at Hillsdale in the 80s in Southern Partisan Magazine. But it's so good uh, because the title of the piece is uh, Why Flannery O'Connor Never Liked Yankees. And so when you look at this particular piece and you look at what Dr. Jordan is arguing here, he says, first of all, Yankees have come to the South, the Bible Belt and the Sun Belt for jobs, for safety, for retirement. They have come to escape Jack Frost, the rude and frigid cultures of their cities, damn Yanks, and a host of economic, racial, and social difficulties. This exodus, one wonders if the transplant he thinks has come from, to the promised land, has taken much of the geographical distinction out of the, out of the word Yankee. But the word designates more than a person from a particular region. It designates the attitudes and values, the frame of mind and outlook on life characteristic of the reformers, innovators, and abstract thinkers of 19th century New England. That gets right to the heart of what a Yankee is. Um, a Yankee is not necessarily someone from, from the North. Uh, it's someone who has a different frame of mind. Uh, nicely portrayed by Washington Irving in... Uh, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow in Ichabod Crane. He says that the epithet Damn Yank is going to be used today. It should be reserved for spiritual descendants of New England's meddlesome reformers, Yankees of spirit, someone has called them. And so then he talks about what Flannery O'Connor had to say about Yankees. <clears throat> she says, he says, as far as I know, O'Connor did not use the word Yankee as a devil term, but she did have a few disparaging things to say about transcendentalism, Emerson, Northern readers, New York City, and New York City critics. He says, to a large extent, the very aspects of modernity which O'Connor found pernicious and deficient are major features of the Yankee of spirit mind, a belief in the progress of society and the perfectibility of man a penchant for innovations, theories, and abstractions, and a narrow provincial insular vision. So she's defending She's defending what she sees and what she knows. Of course, O'Connor being from Georgia, she's buried in Milledgeville, Georgia. He says, in her Georgia scene, she depicted Southerners afflicted with both perennial and modern religious and intellectual disorders. She did not have to go to California or New York City or any other place to find freaks and sinners. She knew that modern vices, not to mention ancient ones, easily took root in southern hearts and minds. O'Connor traced most Yankee corruptions of faith and intellect back to the Enlightenment, that heady phenomenon which encouraged men to substitute for a religion based on revelation, a tradition one based on man's reasoning and his ability to master nature. Uh, one thing he points out is that Southerners have always been able to, to see odd freaks and sinners, to see odd and identify them for what they were. They weren't too concerned about being what we call politically correct. You point out the odd and say, this is odd. And this is something we should know about. Maybe this is something that shouldn't be accepted in society, for example. Uh, 
And so she says in a, in a letter, the notion of the perfectibility of man came about at the time of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. This is what the South has traditionally opposed. The South still believes that man has fallen and that he's perfectible by God's grace, not by his own unaided efforts. The liberal approach is that man has never fallen, never incurred guilt, and is ultimately perfectible by his own efforts. Therefore, evil in this light is a problem of better housing, sanitation, health, etc., and all the mysteries will eventually be cleared up. Judgment is out of place because man is not responsible. Of course, there are degrees of adherence to this, all sorts of mixtures, but it is in this direction the modern head heads toward. So that hits it. She hits a home run with that particular statement. And when you read her literature, it's a common critique of that particular idea. Uh, and people often, as she said, read too much into her characters and other things. They weren't designed to be these psychoanalyzed characters, that they just were what they were. And so I think when you look at O'Connor, and of course, Flannery O'Connor is one of the few people that's often discussed in liter American literature courses across the United States as a representative of Southern literature. You usually have Faulkner, maybe one short story by Faulkner, and maybe a short story by O'Connor, and that's what you get. And they ignore just about anyone else who would uh, be representative of Southern literature. But when you look at uh, O'Connor, and I remember when I was an undergraduate, we read, uh, an we read A Good Man is Hard to Find. We read some short stories by O'Connor in an American literature course. And again, it was always about psychoanalyzing what O'Connor meant in her characters. And sometimes she said, no, a man wears a black hat just because his hat is black. It doesn't mean anything else. So the North has taken O'Connor and tried to shred it, try to shred her writing into meaning something it may not mean or something it doesn't mean or something it was never intended to mean in a type of psychoanalyzing the South. And you saw this particularly in the 1970s with people like Fawn Brody who, tried to, who created a whole genre of psychoanalysis in history. To go out there and, you know, does, does Robert E. Lee, for example, have a feet fetish? This is, um, you know, one of the uh, uh, positions that's been taken up by a now deceased biographer of Robert E. Lee, uh, Elizabeth Pryor, misreading the man. You know, apparently Lee had a foot fetish, uh, and he, uh, that, that drove some of his personality. I mean, this stuff is just ridiculous. But this is what people think, uh, that, you know, we have to psychoanalyze everyone particularly when it comes to the arts, literature, um, and then, of course, also history and who these people were in history. We have, to, we have to take them and put them down on the couch and identify their mental illnesses or perversions or quirks. You know, Stonewall Jackson liked to ride on his horse with his arm up because of some idea of circulation or something, uh, whatever it is. So... Uh, this is, uh, I think, O'Connor's getting to the heart of many things. Uh, now, she wrote um, that Northern readers and New York City critics were often problematic. She said, uh, quote, in the grotesque in Southern fiction, I have found that anything that comes out of the South is going to be called grotesque by the Northern reader, unless it is grotesque, in which case it is going to be called realistic. So she's saying that uh, anything out of the South is grotesque, unless it really is grotesque, and then that's just realistic. She said, no matter how favorable all the critics in New York City may be, they are an unreliable lot, as incapable now as on the day they were born of interpreting Southern literature to the world. Very true. And I think that's one thing that Southerners have always sought, is the acceptance and the acclaim from the North. This is something Southerners don't really need to do. We don't need the North to verify what we are. We don't need the North to tell us who we are. We just are who we are. Uh, and Southerners have long thought that in order to be accepted, the North needed to approve. And, of course, O'Connor's getting to that. That's just not true. And that actually brings us into our second piece of the week by Boyd Cath in New Orleans. A people without a past have no future. 
And so he's getting to the heart of the entire debate on Confederate memorials and uh, you know Southern things that are under attack. And what's happened here, quite clearly, is that there is a number of people in the South, and it doesn't matter. I mean, we're not a number of people in the South across the South who believe that they need to cleanse themselves of the sins of their fathers and uh, eradicate any remembrance of people that uh, they find to be objectionable. Now, this would have been um, impossible just even 50 years ago. Uh, And I remember when I was doing some research on some 20th century uh, history here in my local town, was researching one of the one of the men who was an important figure, and he gave he was running for attorney general, and he gave a speech, uh, nineteen fifty four, where he had to list in this particular speech it was broadcast on on the radio, how many Confederate ancestors he had. It was if you didn't have any, you were considered to be an outsider, and therefore you weren't going to be accepted. Um, and so that was that was part of civic discourse in the South just 50 to 60 years ago. And now, of course, that is seen as a plague. You you want to run away from that. Um, And he mentions that the Liberty Monument is the first to come down. Of course, the Liberty Monument was erected in response to the redemption of New Orleans, the quote-unquote redemption of New Orleans during Reconstruction. And he says, you know, of course, you can see that this monument was... uh, Uh, It did have a racial motivation to it. But what about the Lee and the Beauregard and Davis monuments? Uh, What about those people? These are exemplary individuals, he said. And he said, through through honoring them, the city fathers had honored the soldiers and the extreme sacrifices and hardships endured during a brutal war 155 years ago. And he says, the effort to take down these symbols reflects a frenzied desire to, in effect, face portions of our history to revise the past if it is no longer comports with the ideological Marxist vision that is currently fashionable and politically correct. He says, certainly one can argue that each generation engages in a bit of revising. That is part and parcel of what human beings do to enhance their history and their genealogy by downplaying events and individuals that may not fit smoothly into the current narrative. And essentially what he's saying, you know, he says this, people that want to tear these things down want to Uh, reinterpret and revise history to correct the sins of racism, white oppression, slavery, and rebellion. But he asks the question, what does such zealous purification, such censorship, such abrupt dislocation do to our understanding of who we are as a people? What happens when we radically suppress, rearrange, and expel integral portions of our past? Does not such extreme surgery leave us bereft of a fuller understanding of our historical experience? And he asks, where is this going to stop? Is it going to be George Washington and Thomas Jefferson? Are we going to change the entire fabric of American history? This is a major question. Because these people had views that modern Americans find repugnant. But yet provided valuable valuable contributions to what America is. And he says at the end, you know, a people without a past that is a real discernible history is a people with no real future. These monuments, while some people find them objectionable, actually tell a story about a people. And so are we just going to tear things down because they don't fit with our modern view of what America is or should be? Don't they remind us? We haven't run the piece yet, but uh, uh, there was a piece we probably are going to run in the future at some point. You know, if, if these things are there, if they're so heinous, shouldn't they be up all the time to remind us of the evils, not to take them down? Because by taking them down, if that's the objective to say these things are evil, shouldn't that be there to remind us? Well, we shouldn't do that again. It's another way of looking at it. Taking them down erases them. They're gone. You can't say, well, I mean, we have to remember what these people did, not do that again. Now it's they're gone. So, uh, you know, how are you going to remember that? Leaving a Lee statue up might provide for these people that don't like Lee or don't like the idea of secession a teachable moment, so to speak. 
that man uh, believed in something that's not American, if these people want to say that. And, of course, I think they're wrong. But they could say to their, no, this rebellion is un-American. And we should remember that this guy was wrong. But by taking his statue down, now you remove the teachable moment. He's just gone. Maybe it should be the other way around. But, of course, that's not the point. It's simply a charge, as Dr. Cathy says, a neo-Marxist or a cultural Marxist charge to efface or erase anything that someone can find objectionable. This is the snowflake generation, uh, people that are so easily offended that anything that's offensive has to be erased because they can't handle offense. Uh, So... Uh, This is the problem. He says, Our objective then must be to redeem our history, recover the past, paint it in all its colors, but keep all our monuments and all our artifacts up and visible, recognizing that not everyone will see them in the same light. This is true. Yet even those symbols that some may find objectionable tell a story and open a window on our past. To comprehend who we are, we neglect such a full vision at our great peril. Very true. Uh, and I think that's the that's the issue that's getting to the heart of this. Now, one of the reasons why, of course, people want to tear these things down. I think when when we've run these run a piece on we ran a piece on Confederate monuments. Uh, the real issue is that these things represent defiance, defiance to the accepted order, and so they have to be removed because they cannot handle challenges to their accepted order. So. Uh, Bo Trerick wrote a piece, Confederate Monuments, on that particular uh, idea. The challenge to the order is what's going on here. And I remember there was a piece written uh, by in Time magazine on this, you know, about Confederates, the state song of Maryland. And the particular piece mentioned dissidents. This is dissident to have this state song. And that's what he really didn't like about it, is dissidents. And so it had to be removed for that reason alone. You can't have dissidents. You can't have opposition to the central authority, to them, to the ruling class. You have to conform. You must assimilate. And these things are a symbol of non-assimilation, of not accepting the American regime and what it is. And so I think, and of course, the modern American regime, the modern politically correct or cultural Marxist American regime, You can't do that. Um, So I think in some ways that's the case. And of course, no one in the establishment wants to have any symbols that recognize that self-determination could take place unless it's the American War for Independence. That self-determination is okay. But um, other forms of self-determination, no, you can't have that. Now, on uh, Wednesday, we ran a book review and, uh, on uh, by Clyde Wilson on Arthur Schlesinger's The Imperial Presidency. Now, this was published... Uh, the book was published in 1973. Clyde wrote this in the 1990s. Um, but he basically takes apart Arthur Schlesinger as a court historian. And he looks at this book as a feeble attempt to discuss the problems of the American presidency. Because Schlesinger excuses the abuse of power by people like Roosevelt and Kennedy because, well, that was necessary. But Nixon's abuse of power, well, that was wrong. So it's inconsistent in its critique of what was bothering the founding generation about what could happen with the imperial presidency. And, of course, um, You know, he excuses people like, um, uh, you know, Andrew Jackson, for for example. And so uh, Clyde says this, all this is to say that Professor Schlesinger does not intend to give up the cult of the activist presidency, only the uncritical cult of the activist presidency. So he says the activist presidency is fine, but you have to be able to criticize. But, of course, you can't criticize the people that had to do these things for a reason. And this is, when I wrote my book, Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America, 
I saw a lot of that in reviews. Well, I mean, yeah, these guys may have been, uh, you know, Lincoln might have abused the Constitution. Maybe Jackson did. Even the great Washington. But we should just excuse that because they had to. Or even, you know, Roosevelt. I mean, there was an emergency there. Necessity mandated that they abuse the Constitution. So the people that had to do it, we have to excuse them. We can't be too critical of them. The people that didn't have to do it, well, of course, then they need to be taken to task for that. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as Clyde says, there's nothing new about this trick of being, a, at the same time, a determinist and a moral critic. Uh, He says, for example, in 1949, he wrote, Schlesinger argued that the anti-slavery movement did not cause the Civil War, and two, that the anti-slavery movement was morally justified in causing the Civil War. So which one was it? If the anti-slavery movement didn't cause it, then how did it cause it? He says, in the celebrated The Age of Jackson, Schlesinger began with Jeffersonian democracy, i.e. Southern planter agrarianism, trans morgified it into something which he labeled Jacksonian democracy, but which more precise students have identified as anti-Jacksonian reformism, and ended up with Lincolnian republicanism. republicanism. All these incongruous elements were tied together with a golden ribbon of rhetoric and the package bequeathed as the exclusive inheritance of the New Deal. All the angels are on Professor Schlesinger's side all the time. So he's distorting history to fit his narrative of American history, and that's important. Schlesinger, of course, again, was a man of the court. He has an agenda to uh, solidify strong central control. And that said, that actually brings us to our piece on Thursday, which is written by yours truly, the latest 18th century fake news. And what a lot of people don't realize is that this nationalist vision that we've just talked about okay, was manufactured. In fact, James Wilson of Pennsylvania, if this new find is to be proved conclusively that Wilson was behind it, drafted a new version of the Declaration of Independence just to meet his particular agenda. So what happened was James Wilson, if you don't know who Wilson was, he was a nationalist from Pennsylvania, signed the Declaration of Independence, though he uh, begrudgingly supported independence. He wasn't necessarily on board with it early on. And uh, once... The war was won. Wilson was one of the strongest nationalists in the U.S. Congress. And uh, by 1785, he had come up with this very curious understanding of the, of the American Union. And he said that the Union predated, predated the states. Now, this argument should sound familiar because it's the same argument Hamilton made and Marshall made and Joseph Story made and Abraham Lincoln made. But Wilson said this in 1785, before Hamilton had said these things, or at least, you know, articulated a much more strongly nationalist position in the uh, Washington administration. Of course, Joseph Story had written this in his commentaries on the Constitution. But essentially, the the Union predated the, the states, and that this whole idea of federalism, of state control, was manufactured. And to prove it, he drafted, he had commis- he commissioned, according to these Harvard scholars, this is what they believe, a different version of the Declaration, where it eliminated the state designations when people signed the document. And of course, that, in, in Wilson's creative logic, the last paragraph, which is very important for understanding the original Federal Union, when Jefferson said that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, He said that these United Colonies, again, that preceded the free and independent states, so the colonies created the states. So what he's saying is that these colonies declared their independence together. But that's not true, because Maryland had already declared its independence. Delaware had declared its independence from both Pennsylvania and the British Crown. Virginia had already declared its independence. They weren't waiting around for the Continental Congress to get around to this. They were doing it themselves and drafting their own constitutions. And 
And, of course, he ignores the Treaty of Paris, Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation. If these founders really firmly believed that they had created a nation, a singular national government, then Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation never would have been put into the document. The articles themselves would not have been drafted the way they were. So, obviously, the entire founding generation, save James Wilson, believed that what we had created were 13 independent states, like the state of Great Britain, as Jefferson called it in the Declaration. But in order to make people believe this, this lie, this nationalist myth, he had this version of the Declaration drafted, and he said, aha, here it is. These people didn't believe that they had separate state designations. As I say, if you have to fabricate a document to make your point, then your point is built on a house of cards. But this proves, again, that the entire nationalist myth is just that, a myth. Now, people don't see it that way. They're like, well, these, these scholars are saying, well, here it is. We had this strong central government before. We had one people before. This whole state idea, this is silly. That's not how you should be seeing this. In other words, you should be seeing this as fake news. That the entire nationalist vision was made up. And it was. Wilson was making this up in 1785 to defend the Bank of North America because he knew it was unconstitutional and he needed some justification to say, well, I mean, uh, the states can't do this and so the central authority has to do it. This is an argument made in Philadelphia as well and when uh, Pinckney uh, proposed to have a negative over state laws, which was 100% rejected outright. So again, if these guys believe, firmly believe that we had a, a national government from the beginning, then they would have had a different view of state powers then and during the ratification of the Constitution. And we finished up this week kind of on the same path with a piece by Mel Bradford, the Nabob as anti-federalist, Benjamin Harrison of Virginia. So here we have uh, a discussion of a real anti-federalist, this very wealthy man, Benjamin Harrison, one of the signers, Benjamin Harrison V. He's called Benjamin Harrison the signer. Of course, his uh, grandson uh, would later be uh, president. And uh, so... Uh, the, both Harrisons, uh, William Henry Harrison and Benjamin Harrison, descendants of this Benjamin Harrison, would be president. And um, he uh, was very concerned about centralization. This is a very wealthy guy, and you'd often, if you believe the uh, Charles Beard theory of the Constitution, um, all the rich guys were behind it. Well, here's a rich guy that wasn't. So that, I mean, when you look at individuals, you find that this is not necessarily the case. Uh, Beard's anoc and economic interpretation of the Constitution. Beard was correct about some things, uh, but uh, you know Forrest McDonald blew him out of the water when he really looked at who was behind the Constitution and who wasn't, who stood to make money on it and who didn't. Um, but uh, Harrison was definitely against uh, the ratification of the document uh, because he thought it centralized too much power, and he was very concerned about the influence of New England in this document again. What's going to happen when New England becomes ascendant in the American Union? Well, you're going to have all kinds of problems. So he was predicting this all the way back in the ratification, as were many Virginians and Southerners as well. They were predicting the problems that could happen. Um, so, but here's a guy that's saying, you know, Virginia needs to stay, the Union needs to stay very much decentralized in the 18th century. So it, it fits nicely with Wilson making things up and Harrison saying, no, no, no. We still need to have this... Uh, decentralized union. Of course, that's the union that was sold to the founding generation. We were still going to have that. It was just a more perfect union. It was still a union of states where the states were supreme, but they had delegated a little more authority to the central government. That's the Constitution as ratified. So, hope you enjoyed this week of the uh, Abbeville Institute and our material. Until next time, good day. Good day.